Galaxy 666 by Pell Toro. Session 53. Welcome back, everyone, to Galaxy 666, your faithful guide to Still Here. The second half of Chapter 15 is where we come across one of our few examples of any kind of violent behavior in Galaxy 666. More often than not, the characters threaten violence, as they did in the Space Greyhound, but to this point, it has simply resulted in more discussion. Here, we are short on words. Wandering into an apparently fortified area, Bronit wastes no time in rendering unconscious a hapless alien who happens to wander in. Much has been said in Galaxy 666 to this point about the role of man, his dual nature, empire nationalism, and it all really comes down to our hero, advanced thousands of years ahead of us culturally, assaulting the first alien he can. Notice, too, that for an individual like the remainder of his company, who has singularly defined himself by inaction, in this situation moves immediately to physical violence without a word said. Tis strange, tis strange. I think it also noteworthy just how skilled Bronit is in dealing with the alien ship as well as the alien. It seems the first switch that Bronit tries, the panel, is exactly the one required to move through the mesh. What luck! Also, the activation of the switch alerts no one to his presence. How fortunate! Also, after the first half of the chapter spent considerable amounts of time discussing living metal, we now have an opening that erupts in the mesh iris-like through the use of a switch. Perhaps this is some sort of involuntary reflex the living metal has, as if struck with a doctor's hammer on the knee. Very useful reflex indeed. Bronid is also able to ascertain the function of defense screens, inner sanctums, and the presence of the control room, and how all these things would be employed by the aliens. Maybe this is not too far-fetched an idea, as octopi have been able to figure out how jar lids work, crows can use crosswalks at intersections to their advantage, and many a horse has escaped a barn after figuring out how to flip up the crude wooden lock, though none of these creatures use any technology or tools of their own. The living metal does not seem to extend to the next door, which is much more akin to our standard hinge door which one might find in a castle, and this room tends to lack some of the living metal flair that the mesh had. In fact, it appears that on the alien ship, only the mesh exhibits any kind of living metal characteristics. It is lonely being a door, all by oneself. Pell's very short attempt to describe the room Bronet eventually finds himself in really gives us only a couple of details, the central of which, there are flashing lights. One can never go wrong by equipping futuristic and alien spacecraft with flashing lights. Flashing lights, however, are only good for one thing in practice, getting people's attention. Think of when you have ever seen flashing lights, outside of science fiction films, that is. Emergency vehicles, roadway signs, lighthouses, crosswalks, Okay, Christmas too, and maybe some of the most extreme forms of Hanukkah. And once you have been alerted, the lights are no longer much value. And yet the idea of blinking lights seems forever linked to spaceships and space travel. Even Arthur Dent of Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series knows that a good spaceship comes with all gleaming metal and flashing lights. Again, we have a bit of a puzzle about our alien friends who seem rather incapable of striking back at the humans. Puzzle 1. With the previous exchange of information which happened on the planet's surface, do our heroes not know the intent of the aliens already, and whether or not they are hostile? If the freeze ray was designed to kill, why did the aliens bring the bodies aboard and just set them up in the room? If it was not designed to kill, why didn't the aliens lock them up in some form of cell? They obviously have thought far enough ahead to imagine the need to have an inner bastion against attack, does a thought transfer occur every time Bronit hits one of the creatures? Does that thought consist of, Ow! 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 Why you! Ow! As our description of Bronit was lacking, that is non-existent, to this point, it is only here that we learn how strong and muscular he is with rock-hard fists and other such cliches. Let's mention a bit more about the fight. If nothing else, it should make one thing extremely clear. There is gravity, or rather an up and down. Striking something with force while in free fall, or zero gravity, would send the attacker off in the opposite direction. There seems to be no case of that here. Whatever else Oski was dealing with in his twisting corridor, free fall wasn't a part of it. Also, the force of gravity seems to be in a constant direction and constantly applied, which also rules out Oski's floor becoming a ceiling situation. 
What we are apparently dealing with instead is Pell's lack of focus on what would the characters be experiencing in the situation. We know the ship is in motion. We don't know if it is in space, but clearly everyone can stand and walk and run and fight, so they must either not be in orbit or have some sort of artificial gravity akin to what was present on the Space Greyhound. More research will be required on this matter. What will next befall our heroes, and what of Ishkla and Korzak? Perhaps they have already succumbed to Galaxy 666. Here ends Session 53.